Today, I'm going to show you a model I'm pretty confident you have never seen before. <laughs> Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. All right, let's pop this bad boy open and get to talking. The late 80s was a really strange time for Gibson. The Henry J era had just started in 1986, and they really didn't know what on earth they were doing for a good five years until the Les Paul Classic model starts to take form and take off. So you can find some really strange super strats that you can learn about in this episode, my favorite one being the M3 or the US1. But today we're going to talk about a very little known series that there weren't very many made of. But before we crack into this one, let's learn about the other two. Let's start here, the Gibson Les Paul Studio Light Pro. These are very strange beasts. They're thin bodied Les Pauls, they've got a comfort cut on the back of them, and they offered them in some pretty cool finishes, including yellow, a white, and there were a few ebony versions out there. But the biggest thing to know about these guys is look at these little pickups right here. They're kind of like mini humbuckers, but even smaller. They are in fact humbuckers though. You actually have a coil split switch on these guys. But a nice feature about them is the fact that they have a Gibson Mother of Pearl logo on them. They're actually quite fancy and unique guitars. When they were first introduced, they were just known as the Les Paul Studio Lite, according to marketing materials. However, the Les Paul Studio Lite ended up becoming a chromite body filled guitar of the 90s that looked a little bit more traditional, so most times you'll see those referred to as Studio Light Pros. But besides their unique pickups, take a look at this trem system. This is known as the Steinberger KBX. It is the worst trem system that has ever been made in the history of time, simply because the materials just weren't that good for it. After a few years, the metal inserts in the body will start to bend, and then the trem system is basically just unusable. So naturally, most of them that show up on the market, they're unplayable. There is one guy that knows how to fix them, but I think he lives in Germany. So usually your best option is to just replace it with something else entirely, or fill in the route and convert it to a stop bar tailpiece. However, if you're lucky, you actually can find stop bar tailpiece varieties as well, stock from the factory. And I've always loved the look of these because the bridge and the tailpiece is like almost the same width as the pickups. I've always wanted one of these just to be routed with like five of these pickups because it would just look so strange. So if you're a player or a collector, I would highly suggest going for the stop bar variety, unless you want a bunch of headaches, or you buy one where the KBX has already been repaired. Now you're probably wondering, hey, why are we using Steinberger stuff? These guitars were birthed in 1988 and 89, when Gibson had just purchased Steinberger in 87, so obviously they're going to start trying to use some assets of that company within Gibson. And then next, we need to talk about the sister model to that one. This is called the Les Paul Junior Pro. It's kind of like the Studio Lite, except for you have additional carves on the edge. Everything about this is completely different with the stylizing of the body. They have a very interesting falcon head slash bat wing guard. You only have one of the slim buckers here, but check this out, matching headstock, you can find these in yellow yellow and white, and sometimes people refinish these in other colors, and maybe there's other ones I haven't seen. But the edges of these guitars were actually pretty thin due to the fact that it's sculpted on the front and there's a belly cut on the back. So these are pretty interesting guitars. I've had one of each. The reviews aren't necessarily high quality, but they're there if you want to watch them. But the one downfall to the Junior Pro model is the fact that I've never seen a stop bar tailpiece variety. If you have, please send me photos. But both of these models have ebony fretboards, and I always thought this was as deep as the iceberg went. At least when I made those other videos, it wasn't until years later that I found this. This is the brother model to the Junior Pro, so it's kind of like a, a long distant sister to the Studio Light. Prepare yourself for what you are about to see you have never seen before. This is the double cutaway version of that exact guitar. It's so mind-blowing, mainly because, hey, we've got one of them slim buckers in the neck, but a P90 in the bridge? These slim buckers are sometimes referred to as slim coils. I've never seen official publication 100% verifying a name. I think most of those are just nicknames. The only other time I can remember seeing that is actually on the prototype Gibson US-1. The one that they use for their promo shots shows three of them. Sadly, they were not used in the actual production models. In fact, this dealer sheet just calls it three new design humbucking pickups. However, if you really look closely on this US one, you can see the bottom one is larger than the top two, so that was probably still an HSS setup. And now that we've noticed that, let's look back to the one that's on the DC model. 
it's that thinner one. Perhaps this guitar was simply birthed to use up those pickups that didn't end up getting used, because I can't think of another model that uses this particular slimmer version of this pickup. So obviously, we're definitely going to have to look at this pickup pretty in depth, because before this video, I didn't even realize this wasn't a slim bucker in the neck. Hey, everybody's favorite Steinberger Trem system. This one actually doesn't appear to have too much post lean. I'm very excited about that. But we've got this interesting pick guard design. We have a slightly modified control layout that we'll talk about here in a minute. But it's kind of a cool double cut that most people don't know about. So let's go ahead and grab my first impressions here. Wow, this is chunky. <laughs> I was expecting this to be like seven pounds. It, it might be close to nine, and that's pretty heavy for a double cut guitar like this. But I love it because it kind of reminds me of LeVar Burton. You know, he's got the cool glasses over here in Star Trek. That's what these things always remind me of because the P90 is like the guitar's mouth and then you got the glasses and whatnot. Now, sadly, this particular model, it does not look like it got the ebony fretboard that the other two did. And I, I don't know, can we say it has a matching headstock when the rest of the body is black? Probably not, but hey, take a look at this side by side to what this is based on, a 1958 Gibson Les Paul Jr. You see the control layout down here? They really didn't change it too much. All they had to do was add a toggle switch right here and then move the other control up. So it's actually really convenient to do volume swells on this particular guitar. But the official name for this bad boy is the Gibson Les Paul Jr. DC Pro. At least that's what I always see people calling it. And now naturally, you're probably like, hey, it, it's got two pickups here. Shouldn't it technically be a special? Well, the headstock begs to differ. Yeah, Gibson was strange in the late 80s. And I'd love to say it got better towards the end of the Henry J era, but you got your classic customs and the custom classics. <laughs> How many do they make of these things? Not many. I hardly ever see these things show up on the market. Now that I've seen this in person, it's actually clean enough. I might just keep this one back in my personal collection, mainly because the Steinberger's not absolute trash on this one. At first glance, at first glance, only time will tell. However, it looks like this one came with a Gen 3 chainsaw case, so that's like a $300 value right here, and look what I see poking out. I didn't think I was getting a trem bar, but this almost looks like a custom-made one. Ah, oh, that's cool. I think this is actually the original bar. However, somebody just put a custom wooden tip on it. That is sweet. I love it. And hey, what is this? It's looking like we've got a cool piece of KBX tremolo history right here. It's like a, a waxy paper. Oh, that's disgusting. Yep, there we go. It's the original instructions for this particular one. Yeah, that's cool. I don't think I've ever seen this or felt paper like this. This is like a, the Constitution of the United States or something. But look how good that looks. Kind of a rosewoody color matching with the rosewood fretboard. I guess to learn more about this strange, unique beast, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take a look at its parts and specs. Inside the Les Paul Jr. DC Pro. It is important to call it that because there actually is a model called the DC Pro. You can learn about that in this episode right here. But that came about 10 years after this guitar. So let's start with this. Since I believe this one to be slimmer than the other ones, I think it's appropriate to call this one the Slim Coil. But it measures 0.63 inches wide. So if you happen to have one of those other models with you, maybe measure that. Because I had never noticed that before. But as far as construction goes, it has a really matted black plastic for the outer layer. And then it's still looking like it could be a stacked single coil so it might not have any hum to it we'll have to see but it's all epoxy coated in there but it has the regular gibson braided wiring to it so unfortunately we can't learn too much more about this pickup other than what we can see here that's about 0.7 inches tall it looks like from the factory they just used a foam block to help you set your height adjustment with your screws which are these giant things But as is typical in this era, the P90 pickups actually have clear plastic construction, so you actually get to see all the windings around it. I really like the early 70s ones because they have green wire, but the back just looks like this. And as far as the cavity, they just have one of these plates, so that means you could put a mini humbucker in here if you wanted to. I was unsuccessful in being able to get that thing out though, it's really tight in there. But another interesting thing here is the P90 cover itself. It's a little bit thicker of a material than we normally see, and it's more of a dull matte finish rather than full glossy plastic. However, it has all the regular Gibson markings in it, so I do believe that to be original. And I think they used that to match with this slim coil right here. 
Let's see how our readings are. We got 8.06 for our bridge P90. How's that neck? There we go, 11.92. Now, when you have stacked single coils, if that is what that is, usually you will get a really high reading, but it won't be that hot of a pickup. And our middle position here, 4.93 for fun. But I would assume this is a master volume for both pickups and this is a master tone. This one is significantly harder to move than this particular one. So we'll have to see if anything's been replaced on that. But this is just a regular three-way toggle switch in a very streamlined layout. Okay, now let's talk about the KB trem system. It kind of looks like a Kaler, right? You have just a big top route right here. It's not like a Floyd where they have to route it out on the back or anything like that. So if you wanted to convert this into a stop bar tailpiece, you could. You'd just have to probably finish routing this out and then make a block like that, refinish the entire guitar. And at that point, I can tell you, this guitar gets about the weight you would expect. Because this is what the system itself looks like. It reads Steinberger over there. You can see you have all your individual roller saddles. And these circular marks right here are where the fine tuners go. So it's just like a TP6 tailpiece that Gibson uses or any Floyd Rose type fine tuning or violin even. And the way that works is the ball end of the string just secures down here and then this is literally just being screwed down to push the string down to raise the pitch it's not actually like moving a mechanism or anything i always thought that was interesting about these systems but it looks like you can adjust the height using these allen keys right here kind of like a stratocaster bridge as far as the saddles go and then your bar right here you can tighten it down using an allen wrench but now as far as the back side of the system it's a pretty chunky metal bit right here you've got a little bit of a tongue sticking out right there and you're probably wondering okay what is going on here? This is only half the unit and it's really heavy already, but this is where the spring butts against it. And the springs on all of these are painted a bright neon yellow color. When I first tore one of these things apart, I just thought Gibson accidentally sprayed it because it was one of those yellow guitars. But this one's black and all the other ones I've seen have also been painted this cool color. Now let's take a look at the other half of the unit. These four areas have a screw that attaches it to the body of the guitar. And then you have a tensioner adjuster right here. So to tighten it, you need to move the lever this way and then you pull it up so it's no longer in the cogs and then you move it back here. So that's how you continuously move that. A little bit hard to do with one hand, but what you're doing here is extending this screw and you're compressing the spring that's in here. Or if you're like me and you could care less about a trem system, they actually have a very nice locking feature right here. You just gotta put this tongue up and that just grips onto the system right here where it says lock to keep this thing from moving. And I suppose if you really wanted to, you could remove this screw so you would never accidentally lock it because that secures that washer in place that it rests against. But as far as the weak point of these guys, it's these studs right here. If you don't repair these, what happens is it's a really soft metal so it starts to bend towards the neck and then you just can't get things sitting straight. So this one has definitely been repaired because normally you wouldn't have these nice brass inserts. It would just be these attached to the metal. And it looks like whoever fixed this one future-proofed it as well because now you can screw these in to this new brass setup. So even if you do start to get some post lean or you need to replace these because they get worn out or something, you're going to be able to do that. So if you know how to do metal working, it's not too hard to fix these. But as far as people who specialize in fixing the KBX, there's only like one guy that like advertises the service. But as far as the route goes, there's a deeper area right here because of your spring, then a higher edge right here. Now it looks like this particular example got slightly routed deeper in this area to fit our new studs that were installed right here. In my opinion, that's not a big deal at all. It looks like we got some metal washers on here too. And that's your ground wire grounding the whole system off. But let's have some fun here. Let's see how much this whole system weighs. Just the spring, about half an ounce. The bar with added wooden tip, we're about two ounces total. Now the system that screws into the guitar, that adds some weight, nine and a half. And now the big Mac daddy here. There we go. One and a half pounds almost. A little under that, but yeah, that's why this thing felt so heavy. If you were wondering why on earth would they do a single ply black pick guard on this thing because it literally just disappears in the finish, it's because they're hiding the tenon cover here. It is a nice long neck tenon. And that's the thing that's so cool about this model. There were not that many double cut juniors or specials made in this period in time. I think it's around 1986 when they start to kind of make them again. That's when they have the stop bar tailpiece and the tunematic. Uh, this is definitely one of the more interesting versions that you can find in the 80s. 
For the sake of completeness, the body is 1.7 inches thick. And it's made of mahogany. If you look at it in the light just right, you can still see the wood grain through the gloss finish. This one cleaned up pretty all right. It's got a couple of nicks and dings. There's kind of a large one right here. It's not normally the condition I would keep for my collection, but this is one of those guitars where it's like, I don't really know if a mint condition one truly exists because it wasn't particularly expensive back in the day. Nobody thought, hey, this is going to be collectible. And if we're being honest here, it's not all that collectible of a model, unless you just like weird guitars like I do. Generally, these things sell in that 1,000 to 2,000 range, depending on condition and if your trem system is functioning or not. But now we can move on to our fretboard here. So the other one within the series, I was telling you earlier how it got an ebony fretboard, but this one is a gorgeous piece of rosewood. But how cool would it have been if this was just a completely blacked out guitar? That would have been interesting. But no, they didn't spec them out like that. And here you can see how these dots are yellow. That's because the clear coat has yellowed over this entire guitar. But it looks like it's the regular 24 3 quarter inch scale length. And I'm sure originally it was a 12 inch fretboard radius. I think this one's technically about 11 inches because it's like somewhere in between 10 and 12 but you've got your typical low frets of the era on here i mean they've got a decent crown to them they're not the tiniest frets out there but they're definitely not like modern frets and it's got a nice rounded neck profile but yet the edges of the fretboard are rather sharp meaning that they probably could have rolled the edges of the fretboard to make this a little bit more of a comfortable guitar but as far as measurements go 1.7 at the nut width then by the 12th rocking 2.06 first fret neck depth is 0.83 and oh wow, 0.87 by the 12th. I knew it was a skinny feeling neck, but wow, that is <laughs> really small. A lot of times when you have a super tiny neck like that, that's why the fretboard feels so sharp on the edges because there's just not enough shoulder to the neck to even soften that more. So yeah, if you like thin necks, this is one for you. Here's the neck at the first fret and the 12th fret. You can see it gets a lot more rounded towards the 12th because it kind of starts to beef up just a tad bit. That's why that really low measurement kind of freaks me out. But it definitely goes from C shape to a deeper C, but is very thin while doing it. But speaking of the nut, they do come stock with a black one and you have a locking nut system here. So once you have the tuning set up to where it needs to be, you put this over top of the string and then you tighten it down. I like these because they have the knurled edges so you don't necessarily need your screwdriver to get them out. Why don't all manufacturers do that? But now our truss rod. On this one, everything's looking good. Now you'll see this was definitely drilled off center, but I think they were trying to center it up with the locking nut system, not necessarily the cavity route. But when I first saw this cover, I was like, ah, that's definitely been replaced. Gibson didn't use something like this. And a lot of times they would actually have one that the corners are cut in. That way it still extends underneath the locking system if there's an area for it. I mean, that's normally on Kalers. But when I was reviewing my old video of the Junior Pro single cut, this is the exact same style that had too. So they must have used special truss fried covers on these that wasn't from their normal manufacturer. Even the screw they used was a little bit weird. But here's your Gibson decal, your Les Paul Jr. silkscreen, you've got your black Grover tuners, everything's looking pretty good here. Now that I've got it all strung back up, I want to clarify a little bit more on the lock, because I remember getting frustrated by this before. It's not actually sitting on top of that area that I was saying, there's actually a little notch in between. So if you're trying to push this down and put the lock into place, it's not going to do anything. You actually want it to be somewhere in the middle and then it latches into place. So then this is not going to move on you so you can rest your hand on it and it won't change your tuning pitch much anyways. As far as the trem system itself, I mean, it's got some movement to it. And then of course you can adjust your spring to get more action if you need that. However, th this whole trem system just feels a little bit bulky and clunky. <laughs> There's probably a reason they didn't make these things too long. But besides just the bridge posts going bad, the other common issue on these is right here. You see this crack in the wood? That's because this was starting to push on that and it causes the wood to splinter. It's very common. Is it gonna ever hurt the guitar? Nah, probably not. But occasionally you will see one here. Then there's an, usually another one like right here. Worst case scenario, you could lose this small section of wood if it got really bad. But since everything's in place and fixed now, that wouldn't even matter. 
And now we can move on to the backside. This one does have quite a bit of buckle worming on the back here, but I mean, once you polish it up, it's, it's like so hard to see any of that stuff until you get it in the light just right. It just becomes a big reflective mirror. But here's what our control cavity looks like. It's just really long. So imagine a regular Les Paul Jr.'s layout, except for maybe about twice as long. It's just kind of funny. I'm not sure why this pot's a little harder to turn because they look like they're both CTS. Unfortunately though, I can't read any of the dates they're covered, but we can see through to the mahogany body right here, so that's a plus. And this one's got some dings along the edges as well, especially on the side that rests against your leg. And after a close examination, it looks like the only part that's been replaced on this bad boy, besides the repairing of the trim, is our Schaller strap locks. Definitely need a set of black ones on here instead of gold, but nah, whatever. And going up the back of the neck, you can see that there is like something resting against the guitar right here, either a cable, a strap, maybe even a capo. It just kind of left some dot impressions. You can feel it while you play a little bit, but I mean, they're not super deep. And you've got some other impressions and light nicks and dings. Overall, decent shape. And then we get to see our black Grover tuners, and then we have our serial number. So this one dates to the 21st day of 1988, 571st in production in Nashville, Tennessee. Looks like this one has a little bit of stand rash on the edges as well. But hey, we haven't done a vintage guitar on the show in a while. So let's get that black light on. We'll start on the back of the headstock. You can see a little bit of lacquer rub right here, probably because somebody tuning it just naturally rubs against there. But surprisingly, the stand rash on this one doesn't glow a different color, so it must have been just a pretty mild one. Either that or it's just this side that got it the worst. <laughs> but the neck's looking good here. This confirms it was another stand that kind of discolored the finish right here, but that's not where those dots are. So it wasn't a stand that did that, so not too much lacquer wear on this one. As far as the back goes, everything's looking cool here. And the front is also glowing a nice ghastly green color. All right, looks like there might be a very small touch up right here with like ebony. That was probably due to the whole stain rash thing though. So very cool, passes the test. All said and done, this weighs eight pounds, 6.9 ounces. Remember, the guitar is only about seven pounds. The other one and a half comes from the trim system. So let's go ahead, plug it in and hear how these weird pickups sound. All right, let's go ahead and run through the tones of this, but first, is it neck heavy? Yeah, it's a little bit neck heavy, but that's okay. Wait till you hear this neck pickup. <laughs> kind of gives you some single coil vibes, almost like a Telecaster. But I noticed when I had first plugged this into play, the foam's definitely worn down too much. So if I actually had this screwed into place, it would have sounded like this. Where it gets a little bit more single coil funk to it, but if you just raise that up a little bit, that's where it gets a little bit full Tele-like, I guess you could say. But in comparison to our bridge pickup here, Now let's hear them mixed together. So it definitely doesn't have a hum to it. So I really think it's just a stack single coil, whereas the other ones is actually like a mini humbucker, essentially. Am I gonna say it's my favorite sound and pickup in the world? No, but it's kind of a cool piece of Gibson history anyways. <laughs> Let's go ahead and try some distortion.
has a kind of an interesting vibe to it clean. It still maintains a clarity to it. <laughs> I feel like I want more out of this bridge P90 pickup. It's not my favorite P90 I've ever heard. But it's not too bad either. Then your middle position. <laughs> Now that we know all about this weird, strange beast and its family from 1988, what are my final thoughts on this thing? Is it the world's best guitar? No. Is there so many better guitars than this one for 1500 bucks? Certainly. But this is one of those guitars that, you know, a collector of weird looking Gibsons might like because you get the stack slim coil, you get an interesting P90. It's one of the few double cuts in this particular era that actually looks like the vintage standard, but, you know, a little bit modified to match the 80s. However, I, I didn't really bond that much with this one, but I think it just comes down to, I need to replace the foam down here so I can actually set this rather than just have it be floating and I have to keep micro adjusting it. And maybe then I could dial in the P90 to where it's supposed to be to match this particular guitar. I'm still not a fan of the KB Trem system, but it was nice to kind of get to experience one that wasn't absolute trash. And hey, cool arm to boot. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.